Um, so the talk was to be on debug your design with a tiny interpreter, but what I found out yesterday is that everyone really cares about shrinking the memory of their application. So it's the same content, but a slightly different priority. Um, and that's the QR code for the slides. So we're interested in um, a system within a chip. Uh, you get to the point where your um, finite state machine is too large or too complex. You can choose uh, soft core. Most people choose a RISC V uh, soft core, but you can also, a register machine, but you can also choose a stack machine. And um, why would you do a stack machine? Well, his, they are generally will be a little bit smaller. Historically, people were using stack machines. You remember the HP calculators. But the real big payoff is in the memory. Um, so, and this particularly if you're doing, if, um, if you're on an FPGA, smaller memory means a less expensive FPGA. If you're doing an ASIC, it means less power. So here we have sort of from the AI community, the amount of energy consumed by different parts of the, of the, of the ASICs. Um, the bottom two rows are the ones you want a, a static memory on chip versus dynamic memory off chip. But what really, if, but if that's a log scale, if you look at it on a linear scale, on chip memory is going to be um, five picojoules, off chip memory is going to be 640 picojoules. You know, clearly, a circuit board, big wires, that makes sense. Um, so there's a huge payoff to shrinking your memory. <laughs> Okay, so what's the, what's the solution to shrinking your memory? Stack machines. So anyone who's a software developer, Python, Python is actually runs on a stack machine. Uh, Java, Ruby, PostScript, WebAssembly. Um, <clears throat> Wikipedia has a list of maybe close to 100 different software applications done on stack machines. So just take a look at the Python example. We're gonna do 10 plus five, then multiply that by three, clearly 45. If you look at the disassembled um, code, what happens is it actually turns it into a stack machine. So first it pushes a three on the stack, then it pushes a 10 on the stack, it pushes a five on the stack, it adds the top two numbers, then it multiplies the, the three and you get 45. So your stack grows and it shrinks. Um, There's actually a language optimized for stack machines called Forth. It surprised at the number of people here who knew it. Um, and so, um, so you can see the, the fourth at the top, uh, push three, 10, five, plus, and then the star, and then for the multiplication. Um, and if you, don't like, if you don't like this reverse Polish notation, I should point out that I'm half Polish and actually doing this work in Poland, so it's kind of curious coincidence. Um, if you don't like it, there's a BNF parser, uh, just like the C compiler they, they, we talked about yesterday. Uh, this is a top-down recursive parser, and, but it's only 14 lines of code in fourth. <laughs> Whereas in most of the other ones, it's, uh, most of the other languages, it's thousands or even up to 20,000 in, um, in some C applications. So just another anecdotal example of just how small the fourth programs are. Uh, historically, um, fourth is used very, and stack machines have used very heavily in um, space exploration. So this is, a, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of the Philly lander, which was part of the, Ros uh, run from the Rosetta satellite and landed on the comet for the first time. This had a, a fourth stack machine in it, and it, the link has a long list of space applications, just simply because power is so expensive in space, right? So lots and lots of space applications use fourth. And in fact, even though the WASM design document, they said the stack machine allows smaller binary encoding than register or static single assignment forms. You can read this on GitHub. Um, so, so it's kind of well known that stack machines are smaller, have smaller memory. So I did a, there's a whole book on historic stack machines. Um, I did a review of all the, um, the more recent soft core stack machines. The most common one is the J1. They all have different optimizations. There's this huge family. You've got uh, J1A in Spinal HDL and VHDL and Verilog 32 bits, 16 bits, 64 bit, a huge, huge family. The original J1, really brilliant by um, James Bowman. He started off with a, video application with 32-bit um, register machines, 32 registers, it took him 16 kilobytes. Um, and then he ported it to a 16-bit stack machine and he shrank it down to six kilobytes. So it was like 60% smaller. This was not a refereed paper, but it's consistent with what I, I know of the um, technology. And so then um, the, the J1, the J1A, they have some issues. Um, the, um, 
There's a family of stack processors called MeCrisp. Um, this guy is absolutely brilliant. He, so there are four, actually four different ones. MeCrisp Stellaris runs on ARM processors. Um, uh, tethered MeCrisp, you, you develop on your, on your desktop and you just send your signals out to your device and then when you're all done you compile and you, you download it to your device when you're done debugging. Um, there's also one for RISC-V and I'm working with the ICE which is for the MeCrisp ICE which is for FPGAs. So I actually wrote the documentation on this. So he's German, he's a brilliant developer, but he has four different groups writing all the documentation in English for all of these. And the stack machines are actually faster for stack-based languages. So um, on the second column, so first we're gonna look at the plus. On the second column, you have what's called the stack effect. So you start off with two variables, and then after you add them together, you get a sum, that's afterwards. And so you can do that in a single clock cycle on a stack machine, whereas the people tell me that on um, ARM and C, it takes two instructions, three cycles. Swap is another common stack operation. You swap the top two elements. Again, a single clock cycle on a stack machine. And reportedly, three instructions, five clock cycles on an ARM. Rotate three. Um, these are also Python instructions, uh, Python um, bytecodes. It rotates three. Uh, again, a single clock cycle on a stack machine, three or seven clock cycles. Maybe on a um, risk, so the ARM evidently, you can increment the memory pointer at the same time as you do something else, and evidently on the risk v machines, it actually may take longer. I'm not an expert on these things. Um, and of course, okay, so now we're getting to the interpreter stuff. Uh, these things are tiny, so MeCrisp, uh, the nucleus requires 6.5 kilobytes of whatever application space you have. Most people are perfectly happy in 16 kilobytes. In fact, um, uh, after working on this stuff for a year and a half, I'd never heard of XIP, execute in place. And it turns out that a lot of the register machines actually do execute in place where they're reading from Flash or something like that. You just, you don't do that in the fourth community. And you compare that to MicroPython, at least 256 kilobytes of, of ROM, 16 kilobytes of RAM, sort of minimum. Um, Lua also very large, so really tiny applications. Okay, why are they tiny? Well, let's take a look at the, the, the instructions. Um, both UXN and Microcore have 8-bit instructions, right? And if you take 16 bits, you can actually get three ALU operations in, in, in one of these things. On the bottom row, you can see the register machines. So if I have an ALU operations, I've got 32 registers, that's five bits for the, each of the two operands, that's 10 bits. The destination is another fifth, 10, five bits, that's 15 bits. I haven't even specified the operation yet. Um, okay, so you can shrink it. So instead of 32 bits, we're going to shrink it to, uh, say, 16 registers, but that's still 12 bits, leaving you only 4 bits for the operation on a 16-bit CPU. So it's just, it's just inherently smaller. Um, so the other thing that happens is um, on register machines, you, if, you, if you have a, like a jump, a conditional jump, you don't know if you have to fetch or not, you fetch it, it takes a, a, a clock cycle to decode it, and so what they do is they do a lot of inlining. Well, that just bloats the memory even more, right? And that costs you more. And so what the J1 does is it uh, has an instruction of the first three bits to determine the type, the interesting one then the jump, jump, conditional jump, and call, and those have the 13-bit address in the, in the instruction, so they can do those in a single clock cycle. So then they don't do inlining. Um, as for the ALU, um, if the first three bits determine the type, the next five bits give you up to 30 do opcodes, ALU operations. Uh, the last four bits, the function calls are like um, write memory or write um, to the bus, return stack, change in size, data stack, and you can combine these things together and you get what are called elided words, where you actually execute two stack-based instructions in a single clock cycle, right? And this is, you know, without pipelining. In fact, some of them actually do three stack-based instructions in a single clock cycle. So very fast for stack-based languages. And then I was doing this one application um, with these, um, I was uh, doing a, so a soft core, and it just, no matter what I did, it didn't work. So finally I took one soft core and I analyzed the other soft core, and I realized that the, um, the ICE 40 documentation says that on warm boot memory is preserved. In fact, it isn't. Um, I was able to demonstrate it isn't. There's a whole other talk about that, but, but not today. So, so really great for sort of interpretive debugging and demonstrating stuff. One, one group I'm doing, they're doing a retinal implants. 
And so the idea is if you have a fake retina, you want to be able to focus it. Totally concerned about power. Currently, they have an AVR microcontroller. Um, it's got eight registers, but then it takes 16-bit wide instructions. And so um, they're, they're moving it to a stack-based machine, basically the same family, and they should be able to shrink the width of the instructions down to 11 or 12 bits um, because they don't have that big an address space. And they um, will actually use fewer instructions because they're moving to a 16-bit um, memory uh, application data space. And then I'm doing, I'm working on actually shrinking these. If you look at the old, if you look at the old lattice devices, they have 8K words. They have 8K words of um, memory, but in these little brands. And so it takes a very large multiplexer to, to bring them all in together. The newer ones have these large single port. So the, the brands are pseudo dual port. The newer ICE 40 up 5K are single ports. So you need a, a different version of these stack machines. So that, that's all working. Um, the, what it does, it saves all those brams, and then you can use two of those, two of the brams for stacks, and one bram for a uh, bootloader. Because the, the um, remember that the memory for single port ram is not preserved on warm reboot, so I needed to build a bootloader. So um, anyhow, that's what I'm working on. Let's see, 12, 12 minutes, we can actually do a little demo here. I think that's it for the slides. Yeah. So we can do a demo here. Okay, so here we have um, here we have actually the 32-bit version of the I don't know what that is. The 32-bit version of the oh I see that's because I'm I'm playing with this thing. Okay, uh, what are we so we're gonna put put some numbers on the stack. Ah, oh, thank you. Do you see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay, super. Good, so you didn't see it. Okay, so we put two and three, and we can do like dot s, and so this is just to show that it is an interpreter. You can see what's on the stack. Uh, what do we do? Two and three, and let's do five. And then we can see what's on the stack. And we can do a plus and a star. And we can just see what's on the stack. So that's the, did I do that correctly? Presumably the math works correctly. Um, you can also do dot to print it. Um, if you want to do, so that's, that's sort of the interpreter, the part of the, of the, um, of the environment. This runs, this is currently running on the, on the PC, but it's in Verilator, so it runs on the um, FPGAs also. You can also write a little loop. It's always scary to do live demos. Demo, let's create a little. Uh, so we're gonna do from 10 down to zero. Sorry, that's not zero. Zero, two, I dot, loop. And now when I run demo, okay, there you go. So, so you can, it's got an interpreter, it's got a compiler. Um, I can do a loop for like a million, I can do a, a simple loop with a million items, it takes one or two seconds. Um, and that's f 14 minutes, so okay, I'll take questions. That's why I kept the demo short, avoid the failures. Just say, oh, we can do this. <laughs> well done. Okay, uh, Andre. So I'm an old person as well, and I had a HP 48SX. Hang on, hang on, sorry. Go on, just go on. A question or comment, whatever. Okay, um, I have a 48, uh, sorry, a HP 48SX, so. The calculator uh, versus the calculator, calculator. That's right, yes. Uh, and it's running on a, on a Saturn processor, which is uh, a stack machine. I thought fourth was originally um, actually to, to, to guide a telescope in the original days. So historically, fourths developed were first on and telescopes. That's a true statement. Yeah, yeah. And also the language in, in the 48SX is called RPL. So if you have a chance, look into that. Will do. Uh, oh, uh, of course. 
I'm not as old as you, sorry. <laughs> but uh, I have worked with uh, a bit with the uh, Java virtual machine, and uh, that's also a stack-based virtual machine. So I was curious about uh, what, uh, if you are aware of what are the differences between fourth and the uh, Java virtual machine, as that would help me understand a bit better. The difference between fourth and what? Uh, the uh, Java virtual machine, which is also stack-based. Yeah, so, um, so, so the question is the difference between fourth and the Java virtual machine. So there, um, Java is one of the stack-based languages. Um, there are Java chips. Um, there is a fourth chip which also supports Java instructions. Um, my take on it is Java is kind of built by committee. It's got a huge number of instructions that are just kind of excessive. If you read the documentation reportedly, it's enormous. Um, it's, they're related, right? But they're different. So, uh, but, but both are, I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, so my in interpretation of what you said is that if we build stack machines, we get smaller cores, at least in terms of memory. Um, and we can embed them in FPGAs where we don't need a lot of compute power. Um, but my question is, a lot of the times you embed a risk five processor because you have a compiler and you have the infrastructure to build normal programs. Is there a, a stack machine with a good compiler that you can run normal programs on it? Yes, yeah, so that's why I mentioned the um, the... That's why I mentioned the uh, parser, right? And there is evidently a Pascal language that runs on stack machines, but uh, I don't know of a shipping one currently. But you know, you know if, if you'd like one, I'd be very happy to build one for you. It wouldn't take that long. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's, a, that's the key question. Is, 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 and so the, one of the reasons I did the initial talk on build an interpreter is because when I talk about this, everyone says, that's great. We really need to save our, our memory, but our customers insist on risk, right? So, this is the, so what do you do in a situation? Well, fine, ship risk. But when you actually do the debugging and you need an interpreter to do the debugging, do your debugging with this internally in your engineering people. You know, in the engineering department, you can use good technology. You, know, you can use um, the, the most appropriate technology for the use, and your customers can get to what they want also. So, so that's why the original talk was debug your application as opposed to ship your application with a stack machine. Yeah. Yeah, question at the back. Right, so, so the, so, the, the so Sorry, the, quickly just I'll repeat the question. You've shown us some examples of what stack machines are good at. What are some examples that they are not good at? Well, stack machines don't have registers, right? Although the um, WebAssembly does have registers, and so that's, that's their weakness. And so if you have uh, like a very complex mathematical algorithm where you have lots of different registers, and first you have to add this number, and then you have to subtract that number and divide by this number, and you're pulling from all these different registers, well, then stack machines are busy shuffling, or you're doing memory accesses, which are slower and stuff. So, so they don't have large numbers of registers unless you add them, but then they don't do the real-time interrupts curve. So, so, you know, you need to merge register and stack machine somehow. Good question. Okay. But I don't, I don't run into applications like that. The, the simple ones I've done, it's not been an issue. All right. Thank you very much, Christopher. Cheers. Yay.